bring uh, cutting edge uh, thinkers into the Smithsonian to give us the benefit of their thoughts and help expand our minds uh, as we go forward in this increasingly complicated information world. Our speaker, uh, well, before I go into that, actually, I do want to tell you that our next speaker will be quite soon, May 26th, again here in the lecture hall, and it's David Ferrario, who is the archivist of the United States, uh, a new face on uh, the Washington scene. Uh, he comes from a research library background, which I think is quite interesting. <laughs> And I hope we'll see uh, all of you and more uh, on that date. That's May 26th. I'm also told, for those of you uh, tuning in online, that you'll be able to ask questions uh, after the talk via the Ustream chat feature or through the Twitter hashtag, which is LAM Futures, L A M. Futures, and LAM stands for Libraries, Archives, and Museums, so that might help you remember it. Well, today we are most fortunate to have with us William F. Patry, uh, the Senior Copyright Counsel at Google. And we had scheduled this in February, but like many other things, the snowstorms intervened, and so we're really pleased that we were able to arrange for another date. Mr. Patry is the author of a seven-volume treatise on U.S. copyright law entitled Patry on Copyright. Um, when I uh, Googled him, uh, I found a review of one of his new books, but the reviewer said, probably better than I can, that few people are as qualified to write a book about the copyright wars as William Patry. Uh, and he feels that the seven-volume work uh, is widely held to be the single most authoritative work on U.S. copyright ever written. And we have one of our lawyers, Mr. Patry, who came in on her day off just to hear you today. So if she must agree. His latest book uh, is called Moral Panics and the Copyright Wars. And in this book, uh, it's said that it stands out for the sheer unadorned calm of his approach, that he writes about copyright in plain, thoughtful words with much rigor and grace. Reading Moral Panics is like watching a master bricklayer gracefully and effortlessly build a solid wall, no wasted motion, no sweat, no missteps. Patry knows this subject better than anyone and can really explain it. His background certainly shows how he's gotten to this point as copyright counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives in the early 1990s and as a plan policy planning advisor to the U.S. Copyright Office, which as you, we all know is a part of the Library of Congress. And he also held a post as professor of law in the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law. So without further ado, I would like to introduce William Patry and ask him to come forward. Thank you so much, Nancy, and thanks to Marcia and Liz for inviting me and Claudia for walking through uh, administrative red tape uh, on travel. Um, I've lived here for 13 years, from 1982 to 1994. Uh, I actually lived just a few blocks away, up on a, a street called Duddington Place, which is between First and uh, Second Street. It's a small one-block street, and it was a two-block walk to either the Copyright Office or the House of Representatives uh, where I lived. And, uh, but I moved to New York in 1994 after the elections, and who knows, we may have elections like that this year, too. So I wanted to begin by explaining the title of the talk, which is Copyright as Storytelling, not really the, the substance of copyright law, the, the provisions of it, what this means or what that means, but what I wanted to do at an institution like the Smithsonian is sort of figure out uh, 
how copyright works as an aspect of storytelling, right? Because stories can be told in lots of ways. They can be told in words, they can be told in images or sounds, actions like dance, uh, or through artifacts as well. The argument I have today, and um, we'll see if you agree with it at the end, and if you don't, it would be great, because then you can ask me tough questions, um, is that we also come to understand abstract subjects, like copyright, through storytelling. And I would go further and, and argue that, in fact, it is principally through storytelling that we come to have the views about copyright uh, that we do, rather than through what you might think, straight sort of legal argumentation, the things that lawyers do or that lobbyists might do. My, my thesis today is that our views are actually formed by storytelling. And the sort of storytelling I'm talking about is not the kind that um, you, you get when you're talking to a jury, right? All lawyers who are arguing to juries are told, well, you know, you have to have a compelling story and you're telling your client's story. And that's not the sort of storytelling I'm talking about, right? Because that's just something about disputed facts, right? My client really isn't an evil, bad person, didn't really do those things, right? That sort of storytelling uh, has as its function getting the person off or getting them uh, to win, you're not really concerned with knowledge, right? You're not really concerned with learning anything. You're just concerned with a particular result. So the sort of storytelling that I wanted to talk about today um, is something different. And that is the sort of storytelling that uh, forms the way that we think about the world and forms the basis for how we think about particular issues. This type of storytelling um, has been studied academically. There's a field of it, a field of social cognition that analyzes how we process thought, how we come to knowledge through storytelling. Um, there is a, a person called Frank Smith who uh, wrote a book called To Think. And in that he said, thought flows in terms of stories. We learn in the form of stories. We can't help but think in terms of stories. In fact, he went further and said that stories are the only way in which we make sense of the world. Um, there's a few others who've taken similar positions, uh, Roger Shank and Robert uh, Abelson, um, and they have these two sort of complementary propositions. So we'll see if you agree with them. Here's the first proposition. Virtually all human knowledge is based on stories constructed about past experiences. And here's the second one. New experiences are interpreted in terms of old stories. So in other words, their, their thesis is that what we think of as knowledge, what we regard as knowledge, both about the past and about the present, um, is derived from stories. Um, they argue that we don't come to knowledge through accumulating facts, but rather we come to knowledge through the stories that contain those facts, right? We either accept certain facts, we reject them, or we transform them in some ways contextually, right? And the context is in the stories that are being told about things that are asserted to be facts. Now, there's, a, a, of course, a, a very old, ancient uh, field of knowledge acquisition, epistemology. Uh, and I think it's a really important discipline, right? Because epistemology poses foundational questions that we almost <laughs> always ignore, and, and I think at our peril. So these are some of the questions, at least, that I, I find interesting. One is, what is knowledge? How do we acquire knowledge? What do people know? And how do we know what we know? Now, why do I find these questions fascinating? I find them fascinating because, at least in terms of my own intellectual history, such as it is, um, I have found that I am my biggest obstacle for growth. <laughs> I'm my biggest obstacle for change. I'm my biggest obstacle for learning new things. And it's not because of a lack of resources hopefully not because of a lack of intelligence, although that could be true too, um, or a lack of data. But I think rather the problem in advancing intellectually um, is assuming things 
and assuming things that are either completely false or that aren't completely true, right? We assume that something is true because we just accept it and don't critically examine it. Now, one of the ways that this happens, I think, is that we uncritically accept certain stories that are being told, right? So my focus today is on how do we acquire things that we regard as knowledge that we gain through storytelling, right? And the Smithsonian is certainly much better at doing this than I, um, but I wanted to try in coming here to do something that was, that was Smithsonian-like in stories. Um, now, before I do that for copyright law, I want to go off on what may seem like a detour, but I hope it's not. And that is talk about storytelling in a field that you might not ordinarily think of it uh, as involving, and that's medicine, right? And I'm taking this detour into medicine because I think that if I can, I'm hoping at least, um, that if I can convince you that storytelling plays a role in a field like medicine, you might be more willing to accept the idea that storytelling can play a role um, in the copyright debates. And the second reason is that, and you, you'll find this out in a second, that I myself actually experienced uh, the issue of storytelling in medicine rather directly. So I'll confess that before I had my own experience, which I'll tell you about in a second, um, I hadn't really ever really thought about medical epistemology, right? I hadn't really thought about how it is doctors come to know things, right? I, probably like, like many of you, um, when I was thinking about doctors, you would think about sort of technical things, right? Where did they go to school? What sort of training did they have? You know, did they have specialist training? Uh, how many times have they treated somebody who has an ailment or a disease or something wrong um, with them that's similar to what you have, right? These are sort of experiential things or credential things. And so when you think of medical knowledge, at least I did, maybe I'm exceptionally bad in this, but you know, I would sort of focus on where do they go to school, how long have they been doing it, you know, what, 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 have, what have they learned in terms of experience. What I've discovered, though, is that focusing on these sort of technical things is pretty misguided sometimes. And more important, surprisingly, at least to me, are epistemological issues. Why do doctors think they know what they say they know about me and about you too? So I want to recommend, uh, as strongly as I can, this amazing book. It's called How Doctors Think, right? By Dr. Jerome Groupman. Um, it's available actually on Kindle too, if, if your Kindle fans are Sony e-readers or Nook, whatever e-platform you want to have. I, I'd like the hard copy myself, but <laughs> you can get it in the e-form. Um, he is at Beth Deaconess Israel uh, Hospital in Boston. And as it turns out, uh, I was hospitalized there about a month ago. And I had some of the experiences of the kinds that he talks about in the book, um, that he criticizes in the book. So I've actually been thinking about writing him and say, hey, I read your book, it's a great book, you know? And uh, the same thing happened to me in your own hospital. <laughs> so, uh, well, I might do it, but I, he probably gets lots of letters like that, so that's the reason I haven't, I ha haven't done it, although I may. Um, now in this book, which is really a beautifully written book, I mean, talk about a storyteller. This, he is an amazing writer, an amazing storyteller. And the first story that he tells in there is great. And the book is, is a lot about stories, stories of particular patients and how, how that relates to how doctors think. Um, but in his studies of this issue about how doctors think, uh, he writes that most medical misdiagnoses um, are due to flaws in physician thinking. They're not due to technical mistakes. And he says the doctors make mistakes not because they don't appreciate what the clinical facts are, but rather they miss the diagnoses because they fell into cognitive traps. And he says that the cognitive errors that doctors make produce a distressingly high rate of misdiagnoses. That would be an important thing, right? If a really high rate of misdiagnoses are because of cognitive issues, you'd want to figure out how those happen. And at least for purposes of today, you're probably interested in wondering, how is it that medical cognitive traps have anything to do with storytelling, 
right? And so here's the answer. It turns out that it has quite a lot to do with storytelling. Now, in the book, as I mentioned, he has lots of different stories um, about lots of dis different disciplines, and, and some of them turn out to be sort of difficult emotionally. So I'll take one that's not difficult emotionally, um, and that's radiologists. And also because radiologists would seem to be uh, a field of medicine not very likely to be affected by storytelling. Right? What do radiologists do? They go in darkened rooms, right? and they look at images, right? and they try to interpret the image, and then they say what they see uh, on the image. There wouldn't seem to be a lot of room there for storytelling. But it turns out that radiologists can be greatly influenced by the stories that the referring doctors tell to them. So radiology sort of, in essence, involves two different processes, right? The first process is a perception process, right? They look at the image. And then the second process is the sort of cognitive uh, part of it, right? They're trying to understand what the image is, and they're trying to interpret it. Now, radiologists routinely, and more than you would hope, <laughs> actually, make perception errors, right? They don't see something that was there. And that's important if you don't see something, right? But as important as they are, it's really the second ones that I'm, I'm interested in, which are the, the sort of cognitive process errors. Now, you, only, you, only have, you have to sit down, sweetie. OK, so go ahead, OK? <laughs> that's my son, Jonah, and his twin, Margalit, is here. <laughs> All right, make your way back. <laughs> so the, uh, the, the, the type of errors that you can make in misinterpreting something, uh, I don't know if you, did you ever see that film of Rudy Giuliani, right? He's giving a speech, I think it was to the NRA, and his wife calls on the phone, right? The cell phone, and he answers it. He says, oh, hi, dear, you know, I'm talking to the NRA. Uh, I'll get back to you in a bit. Love you. See you. <laughs> I had one of those Rudy, Rudy Giuliani movements, uh, moments there. <laughs> so some of those sort of cognitive errors could be, well, you see something and you think it's normal, but it's not normal. Or you see something you think is abnormal and it's normal. <clears throat> um, so those sort of things you, you might sort of expect. But what sort of errors can occur when a referring doctor says something to the radiologist, right? Where the error occurs as a result of what's said, right? And so radiologists, you know, get different things from doctors, right? Doctors say, do this sort of a test, right? But they can say other things too, right? They could say a bare bones things like, well, just give me a diagnosis, right? Do this test and then just tell me what you think it is. That's really not a story <laughs> at all, right? Or the, the referring doctor could say, um, the patient has abdominal pain. Right? That's not much of a, of, a, of a guide either to the radiologist to figure out what it is that uh, the radiologist is to look for. Or the referring doctor could say something like, the patient has pneumonia confirmed. So what happens when a radiologist gets something like that, which is a statement that the patient has pneumonia and confirmed? Well, there's a number of possibilities of what could happen, right? Depending upon who the radiologist is, um, how they felt at the time they were doing it, which is sort of frightening, but it's true. Um, and also, cognitive issues can, can influence this, right? And so one of the cognitive issues is what behavioral economists have called the availability heuristic, availability sort of shortcut. And so as it turns out in medicine, um, what a doctor might think you have is influenced a lot by what they have been seeing at the time. Right? So if a radiologist has been seeing a lot of pneumonia cases, um, it turns out to be more likely than not that they might think that what they have in front of them is pneumonia too, you know, if it's sort of within the general parameters of what, what, what the patient has. Are you okay, Jan? I guess so. Okay. <laughs> There's another uh, sort of cognitive issue, which is called, uh, and since I work for a search company, I find this one particularly interesting, search satisfaction. Right? So let's say you're looking for something, and you find it. What most people do is stop. <laughs> Once you've found what you're looking for, that's sort of it. You don't go further, and you don't search for things, say, that you weren't told to search for. You just sort of stop there. You, you're satisfied, and that's the end of it. Now, um, in, in this book, How Doctors Think, uh, Dr. Groupman tells of a really 
uh, interesting study that was done at the University of Pennsylvania about how search satisfaction influences what radiologists do. Um, so in this study, radiologists were told that the patient probably had pneumonia. This is one of those first things, right? Patient has pneumonia confirmed, right? Okay, so there was that. But unbeknownst to the radiologists, unbeknownst in the sense they weren't told about it, there was a second more serious problem that was clearly visible in the MRI, and this was a tumor, a bad tumor in, in the scapula. Now, the MRIs have been done elsewhere. Right, and the radiologists were, were just given them. But because this was a, a study, what they did is they uh, had this apparatus like a bike helmet, and they put it on the radiologist's heads, and it had a visor, and it had a miniature camera, video camera in it. And what this camera did is it put an invisible light on the radiologist's eyes, and it was tracking them to see where their eyes were going. Okay. So they gave them the MRIs, they're wearing this helmet with the visor, and they're looking. Now, in a number of cases, the radiologists found the pneumonia, and they stopped, right? That was it. That was search satisfaction, right? In some other cases, however, they actually looked further, and they saw the second abnormality. But, and here's the surprising part, and why the study is sort of chilling, <laughs> I think, is that when they were writing up their report, they only wrote up that they saw pneumonia, right? Even though the apparatus showed that they had seen the second and far more serious tumor there. So in these cases, the conclusion was that cognitively, right, the radiologist's mind had closed after identifying pneumonia, and that cognitively they didn't accept the other findings. And they didn't accept them because there was one story. Right? The one story was, this person has pneumonia. And the amazing thing about it is that they knew there was a second story there, at least perceptually, but cognitively they didn't. Pneumonia was the complete story. Now, I actually had a similar experience myself, which, which I referred to earlier. So it's like on February 10th, I woke up in the morning. I'd otherwise been feeling great. I'd actually had an annual physical in January. My doctor said I was in perfect health. Right? February 10th, I wake up, and I felt like I'd been in a car accident, that my shoulders were completely fractured, my hips hurt. And this was like excruciating, debilitating sort of pain. Um, I thought it would just go away, you know, maybe a pinched nerve. I, I'd slept with my arms over my head for some reason, and I thought, well, it'd just go away. But after a week, it didn't go away. So I went to the doctors, and I ended up going, at that point, to six different doctors. I had like four or five different blood tests, and there was no real diagnosis. In fact, I had one doctor who rather cavalierly said, ah, I'm going to write down that you have no diagnosis at all, but, you know, if you still hurt, come back and give me a call in a few weeks. I actually haven't called him, not surprisingly. <laughs> so after enduring that, uh, my in-laws in Boston said, well, you've got to come to Boston, and we have a good friend who I actually knew too, who's a world-famous neurologist who is at Beth Deegan Israel Hospital. Right? Go see him. So you know, they got me in to see him, which took you know, a little stroke. So I go and see him, and then... Just by looking at me, he declares I have acute brachial plexus neuritis, right? Just by looking at me. But he then confirms it, you know, by doing physical things and making sure that he, you know, presses enough places so that I'm in excruciating pain, <laughs> right? Yep, 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 you're in pain, right? That's where it is. Um, and then because he wasn't entirely immodest, um, he ordered MRIs, right? Okay, so I go into the hospital, because there's also an excruciating pain still, and we're getting these MRIs done. But before I go in to get the MRIs, for which I had to wait 32 hours, um, the attending physician finally comes around, you know, followed by the medical students and, and you know, other, other doctors who are in training. Um, and you know, they asked me to tell my whole story again, and I do, and you know, tell him what the, the neurologist said. Um, and he says, hmm, I, mean, I don't think that's what you have. I think you have something else. So I'm going to order an extra MRI for that something else. 
Okay, that's fine to me. I don't care. I'm, I'm getting an MRI, two, three, four. What's it matter to me? Um, so uh, the MRIs come back, and then that attending physician says, aha, the MRIs confirm what I thought you have, and they refute what the first doctor said you had. Now, this first doctor was actually his mentor, so there's no rivalry there, right? But he says, no, you didn't have that. The MRIs clearly show that you have bisectal tendinitis. Um, so then I get discharged, and they give you a piece of paper, and the discharge which says this. I'll, I'll just read you the first part. It says, you were admitted to evaluate your severe shoulder arm pain. We have found. Right, we have found that you have biceptial tendonitis and not the more serious complaint that we feared, a brachial plexus injury. Right? That's what they said. So then they go on to say, well, certain drugs are very effective for treating this condition. They helpfully warn me about constipation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, they give me super, super powerful narcotics, right? which turn out not to help me at all. <laughs> and so when they don't help me at all, I, I stop taking them. That causes like really severe sort of withdrawal pains. And so I, I wean myself off of those after a brutal few days. Um, but then I'm back to nothing again. Right? So I go to another intern, who's a friend of mine in Connecticut. Um, I give him the whole 10-week history, the whole 10-week story. He's got access to all the other stuff that all the other doctors have magically both through faxes and online records. Um, and he says, well, you know, those, those guys in, in Boston at Beth Deacon Israel, they had good reasons for what they did, but he thought they were seeing red herrings, right? He thought they were seeing what their specialist training had trained them to see and to know. And so, yeah, he could see why they would have thought that, but he thought it was actually something else, like an autoimmune issue that was sort of systemically attacking things and, and, and showing stuff up. The other stuff was there, but that wasn't what was actually causing it. So he gave me a, a rather common anti-inflammatory. Some of you may have had prednisone, um, we know, which actually has been working pretty well. Um, and I've had like two other blood tests and, you know, um, the levels are, are down pretty well. This is only two weeks ago, mind you. So I can't say I'm out of the woods on it, um, but I, I will say that after this experience, my... Um, understanding of knowledge, even in medicine, is that knowledge is a pretty fragile thing. Right? It's a bit Russian-like, right? that what we regard as knowledge is going to be very different depending upon who's telling the story. All right, now, let me get back to copyright law, because this is supposed to be about copyright. Right? Um, so how does it apply to copyright? How does this idea that the stories that are told impact dramatically? on what we think we know. And so I wanted to start with the best of the best, uh, the greatest of all storytellers uh, about copyright, and that's the late uh, Jack Valenti, who was the head of the Motion Picture Association of America. Now, I knew Mr. Valenti for many years from when I worked uh, for the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, he came before us many times, and uh, he was a great, amazing guy. I, I admired him deeply. He was the best lobbyist I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, I always felt incredibly honored and privileged you know, to be uh, in, in his presence. I didn't agree with him, <laughs> but you know, he was a fascinating, amazing guy. And, and you couldn't help but actually sort of smile at his enthusiasm, at his passion, and mostly at his facility with language um, and stories. Uh, so in 2003, he gave a speech um, at the Duke Law School. And it was entitled uh, Moral Imperatives in Copyright. And he began his talk with a story, right? But it was a story of a special kind, right? Now, we've all been to lots of speeches, um, and I've given a lot of speeches, too. Some speakers sort of pull a, an introductory story out of their hat, right? And they do it because it's sort of an icebreaker. You know, you're nervous about opening your mouth in front of a bunch of strangers, right? So you think you have to tell either a joke or you tell a story or you tell a story that's a joke, you know, that sort of a thing. But once you tell the story, you go on to what your speech is really about. And there's rarely, if ever, any connection between this introductory icebreaker story joke and the actual content of your speech. Not true for Jack Valenti, right? He was an amazing speaker and an amazing storyteller. He never pulled anything out of a hat. 
When you hear him, you'll think he's speaking extemporaneously. Not true. He had memorized it. Right? He spent hours and hours memorizing what he was going to say so that he could stand up there and make it seem off the cuff. It wasn't off the cuff. Uh, he wrote a book about public speaking, actually, which I would recommend again highly. It's called Speak Up with Confidence, How to Prepare, Learn, and Deliver Effective Speeches. And he tells you everything that he does. Right? If you saw him talk and you read the book, you would realize that he took his own advice about how to do these things, and he did it incredibly. In this book, he describes how he became fascinated with public speaking, and he became fascinated with it at the age of 10, which is really early, right? My twins are eight and a half. And I, I would find it astonishing if in a year and a half they decided that they were really interested in becoming public speakers. <laughs> But he did. <laughs> he did. That was who he was. And he'd been doing it since he was 10 years old. Right? And he describes how he's a very careful, clinical observer of people's speeches. So what I want to do is play you the introductory part, what most people might regard as the warm-up sort of story um, in this, in this uh, speech he gave um, at Duke. All right, let's see if this works here. Here he comes. Thank you very much, David, for that introduction. A little brief, but that's all right. <laughs> anyway, it's kind of you, kind of you, and uh, more than I deserved. First so thing why I'm going to do the... is start my stopwatch. Hold on, sir. But I got to tell you a story about this. I can see it on my screen. You can't see it there. When I was a small there. boy growing up in Houston, Texas. Growing up Catholic, and the grandson of okay, Sicilian we'll see it? No. peasants. And Hold on, one Texas second here. The internet is seeing it. Yes, the internet seeing it, and this is seeing it. It was the Bible Belt, where there were very few Catholics, and you can bet your bottom dollar, damn fewer Sicilians. I can tell you that. I believe you're going to have to, to take to it off with of my the family at 7 uh, every Sunday. network line. Then, excuse me. I would go with my Protestant buddies to what is known in town. It worked before. Texas of the Brush Arbor Revival. Because, let's see. Easy for you to say. <laughs> Ready to try again? Uh, we made this actually. On a flat piece of parched Texas earth, they have a tent, 500 folding chairs, and a pulpit where circuit riding preachers would come. And for a couple of hours, kick the hell out of the devil all the way up and down this, this Texas flatlands. And one day I was with a 10-year-old friend of mine and his father, okay. and there approaches the pulpit. This we'll do it without the video then, sorry. The greatest filibustering preacher of all time could go four to five hours and never have to go to the bathroom. That's a ter right, terrible situation. So the first thing he did is he hauled out a big pocket watch and put it right in front of him. And my young friend tugged at his daddy, and he says, Daddy, what does it mean when the preacher takes out that watch? And the father leaned down, and he said, Son, not a goddamn thing. <laughs> so what, what, what Mr. Valenti is saying is that, you know, he was a uh, Catholic and a Sicilian, and he would go to Mass on Sundays, and then after going to Mass, he would go with his Protestant buddies to go see these uh, preachers who would come out uh, on, on a circuit, right, in the, in the flatlands of Texas. And one day when he was 10, right, he goes with this friend of his father's, and this preacher comes who he says is the greatest filibustering preacher of all time. He could go four to five hours, right, and never have to go to the bathroom, which, of course, is a terrible situation for young kids, as we found out. Um, so the first thing he did, this preacher did, uh, is pull out this big stopwatch, right, 
And so his friend asks his father, what does it mean when the father pulls out the stopwatch? And the father says, not a goddamn thing. Right? Now, why did Valenti tell that story? Right? I don't think it was coincidental that uh, in this story, he was 10 years old, which is also the time, of course, that he says in his book that he became most interested in public speaking. I also think that Mr. Valenti was in the story twice. Right? He was the boy, and I would argue that he was also the preacher in the story, in the sense of relating the story to us. I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Right? So the story that he's telling us really is a story about beliefs, I think. And I think he was aware that when we hear a story, we look for the beliefs that the story is, is supposed to convey, but we find those beliefs by the beliefs that we ourselves already hold. So when we go on to the rest of the actual speech itself, I think what his goal was is to sort of transfer sort of fundamental religious beliefs that we have onto the economic views of his clients. Um, and we shouldn't forget that the title of the speech was Moral Imperatives and Copyright Law. Right? In the beginning of this, this warm-up sort of story was about what it's like to go out and hear religious speakers in Texas at those times. So what, what I believe is that this warm-up story was actually the beginning of the talk itself. Right? It was sort of disguised as a warm-up story, but it wasn't. It was actually the talk itself. And why it matters is that his way of telling stories right, was a way of getting you to believe certain things through other things. Now, uh, I want to run you, I'm sorry for the video, the, what you would regard as the actual beginning of the speech. Right? He told this funny story, and now he's launching into what we would regard to be the regular part of the story. Um, unless it starts at the beginning again. Yep. Day until great phenomenon. We actually had worked this all out beforehand. Do, and they had the power to of if only the rubes, if only the rubes and the rabble and the unsophisticated. Well, anyway, what does it mean when the preacher? Almost they, What does it mean? They, what does go. it mean when the preacher takes out that watch? The father leaned down and he said, son, not a goddamn thing. Yeah. Now here's I'm the beginning of the actual problem. speech, okay? That's the end of the story. Dean here's Parker, the speech. Thank you so much. Uh, I had a chance to visit Duke Law School today. And as a fellow who always wanted to be a lawyer, somehow took the crooked path. Uh, I was very impressed, particularly with the technological advances that you have. I thought I was on a Star Trek set for a while there. It's incredible what you have done. I'm going to try to speak with you as brief a time as I can, and then perhaps we can have questions, because I think you and I talking together about this is uh, something that's useful. I'm glad to hear that you had Larry Lessig here. Larry and I have debated three times, oh, four times, I guess, and I find him a thoroughly charming, brilliant man although we're on the opposite sides of just about everything, including the Eldred decision, which I sat in the Supreme Court, and I told one of my friends it's going to be a 70-2 decision. Unfortunately, I, I didn't pick the right justice. I got Breyer right, but I didn't get the other one right. But Larry and I take our little show on the road, kind of like snappy songs and snappy patter, and we get along wonderfully well. So I have here two pages of my speech. And I hope that... Uh, he never looks at the pages, by, me mind you. <laughs> he just gets up and he does it. But, but let here, me begin by here's saying, speech. no free democratic country, no free democratic country can lay claim to greatness if it doesn't construct some kind of a moral platform, a moral imperative, if you will, to guide the society and have the society recognized and respect civic trust. This moral imperative applies to every business, every industry, every profession, every university, and the government as well. It is defined by what William Faulkner called the old verities. 
words that really illuminate what a free and loving land is all about. Words like duter, duty, honor, service, integrity, pity, pride, compassion, sacrifice. Now, if you regard these words <coughs> casually, if you find them uncool, <coughs> or if you treat them as mere playthings that only the rubes and the rabble and the unsophisticated and the unlearned observe and honor, then I'll tell you, my friends, you and I will witness the slow undoing of the great secret of America, without any question. Now, newspapers late... Okay. Now, to me, if you go back and listen to his beginning story, it's seamless. It's a part of one story. He told lots of other stories, too, right? There he was tying together religious issues and moral imperatives, and he goes on to talk about those issues. But he told lots of stories. So his most famous one is the, uh, is the Boston Strangler one, which some of you may, may have heard the quip. So in 1983, um, there was a case going through the courts on uh, VCRs, on the Betamax, and whether you could tape off the air. There are also issues about home video, which was then becoming um, a brand new market. And uh, uh, Hollywood wanted to stop both uh, over-the-air taping and wanted to control the home video market. And so in 1983, he gave testimony before Congress. It was actually out, out in Hollywood. Um, and in that testimony, he attempted to portray the VCR as a dire threat to Hollywood. And here's what he said. Now the question comes, well, all right, what's wrong with the VCR? One of the Japanese lobbyists, Mr. Ferris, had said that the VCR, well, if I'm saying something wrong, forgive me, I don't know. He certainly is not MGM's lobbyist, that's for sure. He said that the VCR is the greatest friend that the American film producer ever had. I say to you that the VCR is to the American film producer and to the American public as the Boston Strangler is to the woman home alone. Now, part of the story is just crude xenophobia, which regrettably was not uncommon at the time. Right? The evil Japanese are depicted as sort of economically dive-bombing Hollywood, you know, resulting in sort of a, a copyright Pearl Harbor. Uh, Hollywood, however, is portrayed as the woman home alone and is being threatened by this mass murderer on the loose which the authorities, in this case Congress, really are, are duty-bound to stop, and they're duty-bound to stop by giving Hollywood control over the design of consumer electronics and over the home video market. The, the point is that the story turned out to be false. It turned out to be completely false, because the VCR did turn out to be Hollywood's best friend, as Hollywood itself admitted. Right? A number of years later, Sumner Redstone, head of Viacom, which owns Paramount Studios, said that home video was the bonanza that saved Hollywood from bankruptcy. Right? Now, there have been other stories, really identical stories, that have been told for decades about the threat to copyright owners from new technologies. And the stories are always about something else, right? something that um, is a moral panic. Right, moral panics are this uh, uh, term that was coined in the 70s by a British sociologist called Stanley Cohen. Um, and it's about things that are perceived to be existential threats to society. Some of them are actually rather funny. Comic books right, used to be considered an existential threat to society. There were hearings before Congress. Um, but there are other you know, more, more, more famous ones. Um, the two burning witches, of course, and you know, the McCarthy era. Um, for Republicans, the Obama era may be a moral panic. Um, but the story is always about the other, right? Capital O, the other, right? Somebody different. Somebody not only different, but dangerously different. And so if you're going to use those sort of moral panics for copyright, you've got to tie copyright somehow to this moral panic that's going on in society in general. So that's the reason he chose the Japanese at that time. It is true that the manufacturers were Japanese, but also at that time there was a lot of concern about the, the balance of uh, trade payments with Japan, which was very, very unfavorable. And so it was crafted to, pay in, uh, to, to tie into that. 
As things evolve, of course, you always need to find a new other. Right? You always got to find some new existential threat to whom you can tell the story about. And so it changes. And it's changed in the copyright debates too. And Mr. Valenti was really good about that. So in the early 2000s, one of the big concerns was peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Right? Napster, which actually wasn't peer-to-peer, -peer, but Grokster, things like that. That, that was a, a big threat. And I'm not denying that there, there weren't issues there. Um, but you need to conjure up a story that's going to tie it into general societal stories. And so one of the things that was going on at that time, too, was concern about child pornography on the internet. So Mr. Valenti goes and testifies, and he sought to tie the copyright issues to child pornography. And he testified before Congress that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing should be banned because it makes the most throat-choking child porn available on a scale so squalid that it will shake the very core of your being. Of course, there are more than adequate laws already on the books to deal with those issues, and rightly so. And as a father of young children, I'm all in favor of it. I'm in favor of the death penalty for those things. So, you know, you're not going to catch me saying there's not a problem, there's not a way to deal with it. It's just that there was existing laws that were fine, and you don't need to relate that issue to an issue of copyright infringement. Um, a few months after the September 11, 2001 attacks, and my kids were born September 12, 2001, which is a whole story, um, in New York, um, Mr. Valenti sought to link copyright infringement to terrorism. Right? So he testifies just a few months after September 12, um, uh, September 11, um, and he says this. He says that trafficking in pirated goods accounts for much of the money the international terror network depends on to feed its operations. And he argued that Hollywood was fighting its own terrorist war. <laughs> right? Okay. Now, the purpose of each of these assertions, of course, is to understand the very different story of copyright through a story of other things that are threatening events to society as a whole. So sort of like, you know, Rashomon, the great Akira Kurosawa movie, there's lots of stories. And to give the other side of it, there are lots of stories, I think, that would deny the copyright owners face any threats, right? This sort of side of the debate, which is typically called the copyright left side, um, thinks that motion picture studios will be able to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in the production and distribution of movies, um, but the films will be widely available on the internet even while they're still theatrically released um, without any, any payment at all. Um, and the same for books and, and music and other things. So there are legitimate threats to copyright owners from unauthorized use. Um, and I think it's a mistake to construct stories that say that we can have vibrant copyright industries but not find a way to deal with that sort of piracy. So the bottom line for me, and I'll stop here so we can take questions, is that we all love a good story, and stories are great, and we understand things through stories, but we owe ourselves a duty, just like I found out in my medical travails, to get the right story, to get the true story, because it's only if we find a story that actually fits what reality is, I think that we'll be able to find a good solution. So uh, thank you so much. Huh. Like being at a rock concert. <laughs> so, do I, how do we want to do it? Questions from the audience first. Questions from online. Oh, Yoni, you have a question. Yes. <laughs> you have to go to the bathroom again. No. No. What's your? Oh, you're just kidding. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> I like that. Somebody has to go first. I appreciate it. I'll go first. Um, one of the problems that uh, has been talked about a lot is about the length of copyright um, and how it's been extended over time and extended. Um, what are your views on that issue and whether or not it's possible to change it? Right. So I think that we can't change it. Um, I think it's a tragedy that we, that we can't change it. Uh, so the term of protection right now is for individuals. Life is life of the author plus 70 years after you die. Um, and for corporate works, it's 95 years from the date 
generally a, a first publication. Um, when we first started out with copyright in uh, 1790, it was 14 years from publication plus another 14 years if you filed a renewal term. That was generally increased. I think in 1832 it became uh, 28 years plus 14. In 1909 it became 28 plus 28. And in 1950, I mean 1978, it became uh, life of the author plus 50 years. 1998, it became life of the author plus 70 years. Um, so the sort of story behind how long copyright should last, <laughs> right, is that the reason we have it is that we want to encourage people to create things that they would, they would not create but for uh, copyright uh, being there. Because if they created something that was valuable, then people would take it after it came out and you would lose your ability to be compensated for that. Um, that sort of story presumes two things. It presumes, in fact, that people create things because of copyright. And if we didn't have copyright, they wouldn't create. And it also assumes that the length of time that you give to copyright owners is a sufficiently long period of time that they can get back their investment plus you know, a healthy profit. Um, but it's not so long that it impedes other people from using the work too. Right? We have a constitutional limitation in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution that says copyright can only be for limited terms. So even if we wanted it to be perpetual, constitutionally we couldn't. And so since it can't be perpetual, you've got to figure out what it is less than perpetual. Jack Valenti once very amusingly said, he wanted it to be perpetual, he knew it couldn't be, so it should be for eternity less one day. Right? And only he would know what that is, I'm sure. Right? So something in between there. Right? Uh, so how you balance that out is, is sort of an interesting thing. So one way you might figure that out is, OK, which works actually need copyright? There's a lot of works that don't. You don't need copyright to write an email. You don't need copyright to do general sort of commercial things. Um, you don't need copyright. Um, to write student papers. You know, there, there are lots of things that are done that you do for utilitarian reasons that have nothing to do with copyright. There are lots of things that people do um, they wouldn't do, um, but for copyright. People who make their living off of writing songs, writing books, making movies, things like that, they absolutely have a legitimate claim to uh, copyright to encourage them to devote themselves to producing those things. Okay, now, so how do you figure that out? Um, that's a great question. Having worked for the um, legislative branch uh, here for seven years, you know, those were questions that you sort of ask yourself. So how do you actually accept what the premise is but get to an actual concrete result? Right? What, to, to, to harp on the theme of this, what's the story that's being told about it and how do you actually make it happen? So you could say, well, you know, um, we love authors, authors are great, they are great, and we want to give them as much as they can and we're not going to worry about it. Um, or you could try to figure out quantitatively. So I work for a company, Google, that is very quantitatively driven. Right? We want to quantify how things work. Um, now, how would you do that for a copyright term? There actually is a way to do that. So when I worked for the copyright office, um, the copyright office had done a bunch of studies about the renewal term. So it used to be from 1909 to 1978, or December 31st, 1977, there's a 28 year term of protection. And if you filed a simple document with the copyright office and paid $10, you could get 28 more years. So you would think that if the government is saying, I'm going to give you 28 years of monopoly, and it's going to cost you $10 and a simple form, most people would take it, right? That's a pretty good deal. $10 in a form for 28 years of a government monopoly. Um, as it turned out, most people didn't do that. So for books, the renewal rate was 7%. For some, it was 3 or 4%. And mind you, this is 7% of books that had already been renewed. <laughs> and most books were never registered. I'm registered. Most books were never registered in the first place. But of those books that were registered, only 7% was renewed. So you would say, for 93% of the books, the first 28 years was really quite long enough. Movies had a longer renewal rate. They had a rate somewhere in the 70s. So to answer your question, 
the approach I would take would be to give to people what they need and what they've demonstrated by themselves um, works for them. There's no reason to give somebody a term of copyright that is 50 or 70 years beyond what they actually need by proving it themselves, right? I'm not deciding for them. I'm just saying if you look at the renewal rates, you could see 93% of the book publishers decide 28 years was quite enough. And the reason this is an issue, I'm sure this is partly what's, what's behind it, is the question of orphan works or unclaimed works or the ability of, of people like the Smithsonian or nonprofit organizations or even for-profit companies who want to make works that are in the public domain or should be in the public domain because nobody cares about them available to everybody else. And that's the, the dilemma. Um, so I, I would say, if I could pick my ideal copyright act, it would be the 1909 act. I would go back to that 28 plus 28, because 56 years is really quite long enough for anybody to have a term of copyright. Right? Most people don't write um, for themselves much longer than that. Oh, maybe Mr. Valenti will, will come back on. <laughs> now the problem, the problem is, why can't we change it? We can't change it because we have entered into a number of international agreements which obligate us to do that. And this is one of the great issues, I think, facing copyright, which is that you know, we say that the issues are global, and they are global. And because they're global, we have to find global solutions, or we have to have minimum global standards to make sure that U.S. works are protected in important foreign markets. All true. But what has happened is that we have been enacting in trade agreements. We have ACTA, which is being debated right now. We had the GATT agreement in 1994. We have free trade agreements with companies like, uh, countries like Australia, South Korea, lots of other countries, in which we have obligated ourselves to this term of protection. Now, uh, I'll, I'll stop my long-winded answer by saying this. One of the things I found when I worked for the House of Representatives that I found the most liberating is the fact that you can undo mistakes. Right? We all make mistakes. And the term of protection of life plus 70 was a mistake. I think even the Europeans agree it was a mistake. Okay, so you make a mistake. We all do. The right thing to do is to say I made a mistake and go back and fix it. Right? We can't now. We can't go back and undo our mistakes because we've entered into so many international agreements that we would have to abrogate those agreements to go back on them. So we're stuck with it, in my view. Yes, sir. There are a couple of questions. Where does it stand now on Google Books, the publishers, and copyright? Right. So we submitted, well, Google was sued. Um, not an uncommon occurrence, I regret to say. So it gives me things to do. Um, so we were sued in the Southern District of New York by a number of book publishers and separately in a class action brought by authors. Um, as in most civil litigation, I think 95% plus of civil litigation settles. So it's not unusual at all for civil litigation to settle. Um, we entered into settlement negotiations. Um, the authors actually came to us and asked if we would be interested in doing a deal on outer print works. Um, and so we entered into long negotiations with them. Um, we came up with a proposed settlement. Um, the Department of Justice looked at it. There were some changes they wanted. We made those changes. Um, we submitted it to the court. They didn't. They liked some things but didn't like other things. Um, there was a hearing before Judge Jenny, uh, Denny Chin, maybe, what, five weeks ago, something like that? Time flies. Um, he recently has been confirmed to the Second Circuit. <laughs> so uh, he has not issued his ruling on whether he's going to approve the settlement or not. So where it stands is we've been sued. We had a deal to settle the case. We need the court to approve the settlement. He's held the hearing. He said he's going to issue his opinion. Um, he since got confirmed to the Second Circuit. So, you know, maybe we'll get an opinion from him soon that will say yes or no. And that's where it sits. Yes. Uh, we've got two questions from uh, JJ Markin on Twitter. The first is how to set free material on which the rights owner is just sitting, for instance, Disney on, and Song of the South. 
and his other is your thoughts on copyleft and similar alternatives. Right. So the first question was, what do you do about copyright owners who are sitting on things and not using them? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So the answer is, um, there's really nothing you can do. <laughs> All right. So if you believe that, um, especially if you believe that copyright is a property right, this is another great story. Uh, I think that, you know, the story of how conceptually copyright is being cast as a property right rather than what I believe it to be, which is a government grant. Uh, a government program, a really important government program. I mean, I'm a liberal Democrat, so if I say something's a government program, I'm not criticizing it. Right? I think it's a really good government program, and I believe in good government programs, and I believe copyright's a good government program, properly you know, adjusted if we could. Um, but part of the fact of it being an exclusive right is the sort of Nancy Reagan, just say no. Right? So you can do that. Right? What does it mean to own something if you can't exclude others, right? Many people believe that is in fact the most important part of something being property, is the ability to say no for good reason, bad reason, or no reason at all, right? When I worked for the House of Representatives, I think it's probably still true, that was true for employees. You were employees at will. You could be fired for good, no, or bad reason. That's copyright. Copyright's sort of at will. <laughs> so the answer is there's nothing you can do about it. Um, there is no concept of abandonment in copyright, right? That would be a doctrine, like in, 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 uh, in real property. If copyright were property, like real property, you might have something like adverse possession or abandonment, a sort of use it or lose it idea. But we don't have it for copyright. And that ends up being a huge problem. Um, it's a problem, obviously, for companies that you can identify, and there you just get angry. Um, but it's an even bigger problem for people you can't identify. That's the orphan works issue, right? You've got all these works that would have gone into the public domain. I mean, think of it for books. You've got books of which only 7% were renewed after 28 years. 93% of those books you could use, right? And you could use them for good purposes. I'm not talking about just using them for what they are. You could use them to create new things, which is what it's all about, right? You could do it in a way that helps people learn from the stuff in there. But no, we can't do that. Why? Because we have a term of protection now that doesn't have renewals, and we have a doctrine of copyright law that doesn't accept abandonment or adverse possession. And that's a huge problem. And you know, there may be orphan works legislation, but I, I think that's something we have to figure out. And it's a problem that we caused ourselves. There actually isn't an orphan works problem. That's a misstatement. It's a misanalysis. The problem we have is a term of protection problem, so I'm glad you mentioned it. The problem is that we don't have formalities, that we didn't have a system that efficiently separated those people who still want their copyright rights, and I say, God bless them, they should have them, from those who don't want them. And we've lost that ability, and I think we have all suffered tremendously for it. And the problem is, is that you don't see the suffering, right? You don't see the things that would have been created, that would have been benefited people, but you can't do it. And, and that's why it's a big political problem, because you can't point to it. You can't say, oh, I would have, the Smithsonian would have done this amazing project, but you know, we can't do it, because you know, we can't find the person, or because they just say no. You know, and people say no for sometimes good reasons, and they say no for bad reasons. When I was uh, 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 in private sector, I worked at a law firm for a guy whose son was, uh, had severe disabilities, and he went to a school for other children with severe disabilities. But they trained them uh, to put on small one-act plays. And they wanted to put on a small one-act play of a larger three-one just for the families, right? No one else was going to see this. It was just the families. They weren't charging anything for it, right? And this was a play that they could do. So I called up the copyright owner of this play and explained the situation. I said, these kids want to put this on for the parents. They'll pay you, but it needs to be a shorter version. And they said, no, you can't do it because we think you have to put the whole thing on exactly as it is or do nothing. To me, that's, that's not right. But that's our system. Now, I've forgotten the, the second question, which was... Uh, the second question was your thoughts on copyleft. Oh, yeah, right. Copyright. 
we left. So I, I, you know, that's sort of an ill-defined term, and, and I plead guilty to having used it. Um, what, what I would answer is in terms of alternatives. So I would, I think the question may be about something like Creative Commons. Um, which I think is an amazing, fantastic alternative, right? So one of the problems in licensing is not that the other person might not want to license it, is that you can't find them because there are too many people <laughs> out there. There are too many works and too many people who want to use it. And what you need is the ability to license works without having to negotiate on a one-to-one -one basis, right? The promise of the internet is that you can have that. The problem of the internet is connecting people. And so one of the things I would say to tie this into the idea of copyright as property, and I would say this to many copyright owners, is get over the idea that copyright is an exclusive right that you want to control everything and start worrying about getting paid. Right? I want them to get paid. Right? So the idea should be, how can I get paid for my works, not how can I stop people from using it? Right? If the focus is how do I stop people from being using it, you're wasting your time on doing that. Focus on getting paid. So the great thing about Creative Commons or other systems like that, where you have the ability as a creator to determine how you want your work licensed, for how much money, no money, for what sort of use, commercial, non-commercial, attribution, derivative works, whatever it is, is that you can do it. And then you never have to talk to anybody who wants to use it. You can simply do it in an automated way. And to me, that's the future of copyright. That sort of collective or mass licensing where it's a win-win where copyright owners get paid as they should get paid, and we get to use the works but respect the terms and conditions that they put out. So to me, that's a great thing. Yes, sir. Following on that, would you like to tell stories about fair use? <laughs> Sure, I love fair use. Uh, I've been studying it for, for a long time. Uh, I've been studying it since, uh, I probably don't want to admit it, 1979. Yeah. So what's your story? Well, you talked, gave us a story about a play. Right. It was in a school context. Right. Couldn't they have done that as an educational exercise for one time? They might have been able to do it, uh, except it was a for-profit school. Uh, so that would have been an issue. Now you could say, as I believe, that, that the issue of profit versus non-profit, say for fair use purposes, should really be determined by the use that's put for it and not the status of the user. Um, and certainly it's an issue for the Smithsonian, I think, since you have two different funds, right? You have funding that comes from like trustee funding and you have funding that is government funding and, there's, and then you have mixed issues where you get it from both, right? Uh, so. Um, to me, fair use is a really important doctrine because it, it is one way you can get over the absolute ability to say no. Right? It recognizes that yes is also a good thing societally. Right? That letting people use things for constructive purposes that may not harm a core economic market for the copyright owners is still a good thing. Um, so I'm a firm believer in fair use. Um, I think we made a huge mistake in 1978. And that mistake was this. Before 1978, there was no mention of fair use in the Copyright Act at all. It was a judge-created doctrine. And it was created because judges realized that society goes forth by learning. You know, the old um, Diodorus Siculus thing about you know, a dwarf standing on the shoulders of a giant sees further than, than the giant itself which is all true. We all learn derivatively. Um, in 1978, unfortunately, we put it in the statute. And then judges started to think that they had to interpret it rather than apply it. Um, so I, I think fair use is, is, is great and, and important. And you know, we, we, we should live our lives as, as much as possible. Have the courage of being common law judges rather than judges who are interpreting statutes. So yes, you, you almost touched on this, but I, I'm curious about setting the fees for copyright. Um, who sets those fees? Who decides? Who decides whether they're fair? And what do we do about escalating costs for usage? Yeah. So that's an issue that Congress has debated for a long time. Um, so you could say, if you take the sort of former Alan Greenspan free market approach, you know, the magic of the marketplace, 
um, which doesn't seem very magical right now, <laughs> I would say, and as an owner of Google stock, you know, I don't even dare look at what it is right now, so I'm not much of a believer in the magic of the market, um, philosophically or as a, as a shareholder. Um, Congress has stepped in at certain times. So the first time Congress stepped in was actually in 1909, um, when there was the first compulsory license. Right? So the antithesis of a free market is a compulsory license, a license being the Congress says, you can't say no. Right? You cannot stop this person, but you're going to get paid for it. Right? And you're going to get paid what amount? And that's your question. If you say you don't have the right to say no, but you do have a right to get paid, there are two questions. How much and who gets it decided? Right? So the first time this happened, Congress said, we're going to decide it. And the answer is you're going to get paid two cents for every record that's sold. The problem with that is that they didn't change it until 1978. You know, the cost of living went up a bit between 1909 and 1978. That wasn't a good solution. 1978, Congress created some new compulsory license. They created one for cable TV, cable TV retransmitting over the air broadcast TV. There they decided, okay, that's not a good idea for us to be doing it, you know, because every 69 years is too long. So we're going to create something we're going to call the Copyright Royalty Tribunal, which was then a board picked of, of five people, and they held semi-annual adjustments. That's one route. And over time, Congress has had a few of these. They had Copyright Royalty Tribunal. When I worked for the uh, House of Representatives, we abolished them and we uh, changed them to arbitration panels. That didn't work out. We have copyright royalty judges right now that people aren't happy with. So um, there's been no lack of failure <laughs> on, on that <laughs> part of figuring out um, both who should do it and how much it should be. Um, there, there, if, if you're not going to let the copyright owner do it, um, and Congress isn't going to do it, and you're not going to have an administrative agency, uh, and I've thought a lot about this issue actually, the only other alternative is a federal judge. Now that actually occurs in two instances. It occurs for ASCAP and BMI, but it occurred because of antitrust reasons. And so there's something called the rate court which actually it isn't a court, it's just one judge. <laughs> and so if you're an ASCAP or BMI user, you negotiate with ASCAP, and then if you don't reach an agreement, you go to this judge and the judge decides it. But that's a really expensive proposition. And so I, there's no great answer to it. All I can say is that we've tried lots of different things. Congress doing it, royalty tribunals, arbitration panels, federal judges, I don't know. I don't know. I wish I could tell you I have the answer. You know, you would think, if you believe in the marketplace, that the marketplace would give you the answer. You know, there's this theory that copyright owners won't leave money on the table. It's not true. They do. And, you know, maybe it's because there's an asymmetry there in information or power or, or what. But it's one, of the, it's one of the great pressing questions. Uh, another alternative, by the way, that's in Europe that we don't have here, is mandatory collective administration of rights. So there, if you're a music composer, you have to sign up with an agency that collectively administers rights. Uh, but then that just sort of kicks the question further down the way, which is what if you don't like the money you're getting from them? What if you don't like the rates that they're charging? So what happens in Canada is that you then appeal that to a court. Right? There's all, there's, the problem is always kicked somewhere down the line because you always need to have an a, a ability for someone to express their dissatisfaction and have their dissatisfaction adjudicated. But it's always got to be adjudicated by somebody who has the governmental power to issue a final decision. Right? Those, I think, are the problems. And they're seemingly insoluble problems. I mean, sort of depressing to say you can think about this for many, many years and not come up with an answer. But that, that's lamentably my experience. Yes, sir. Uh, Cobe Wright on Ustream is asking, how did piracy and derivative works get lumped together into the same copyright protection? They're obviously very different activities. Hmm. So if you, um, I, so it's a nice question of what you define as piracy. And this is, an, uh, this is a term that's being thrown around a lot. 
My preference would be to leave it for its original meaning, which is the stuff that Somali, <laughs> Somalis are, some Somalis are engaging in, stuff that occurs in the high seas, right? Violent acts that occur in the high seas. That's the standard international definition of what piracy is. Um, but if you look at the history of copyright in the United States, and in and, and Europe as well, but we'll focus on the United States, um, the evolution of it has been an ever expansion of rights and no contraction. And not just in terms of protection, right? In terms of protection, we went 14 plus 14, 28 plus 14, 28 plus 28, life plus 50, life plus 70, right? Not backwards, always forwards. Um, in terms of what was protected, we've done the same thing. So in 1790, we protected only books, maps, and charts. That was it. 1831, we expanded it to music. Um, 1865, we expanded it to photographs, probably as a result of the Civil War, Matthew Brady, and uh, you know, obviously you know, the advent and advances in that. Um, we protected sculpture, uh, oral speeches. Um, in 1909, we expanded it greatly to lots of other things, almost all things. In fact, there was a catch-all phrase saying, we're protecting one, two, three, four, five, and six is all the writings of an author, <laughs> right? which was the constitutional term. And so there's this nice question of a new form of uh, production that wasn't listed, that happened to be recorded performances, which weren't really so popular or in existence in 1909. And so were they in the statute or not? And the courts decided, no, they weren't. And it wasn't until 1972 that the recorded performance of a musical work was protected. Now, when you get to 1978, the most recent version of it, we had a term called original works of authorship. Um, and even there, there were some works that weren't protected. So when I worked for Congress, we extended protection in 1990 for the first time to architectural works, the built three-dimensional structure. We had always protected since 1909 architectural plans and drawings, but it wasn't until 1990 that we protected the built three-dimensional structure, at least expressly. The same thing has occurred for what rights you had. Originally, we only had a right of reproduction, which is the right to stop people from printing it. We didn't have a right to stop derivative works. In fact, it wasn't until 1909 that the right to prevent derivative works was granted. Before then, abridgments were okay. <clears throat> so you could have taken a book, say a three-volume book, abridged it into one volume without permission and sold it, and that was okay until 1909. We've expanded rights dramatically. Until now, um, it's pretty hard to think of anything that's not a violation of copyright, uh, especially with uh, anti-circumvention things, right? In chapter 12, we now have a right of access, right, through anti-circumvention technology. So there's very few things that are protected. And so our history has been an expansion in every way, in the term of protection, um, in what's protected, and the rights that are granted. And the problem that has occurred on the internet um, is that the way that the internet functions mechanically, not deliberately, but mechanically, is to implicate rights that technically map onto, say, a right of reproduction, buffering and caching, right, um, is a reproduction seemingly technically, but it doesn't make any sense in the internet space. If we want to have search engines, if we want to have streaming of things like this, that necessitates caching and buffering. It necessitates things that traditionally would be a right of reproduction, but shouldn't be. You know, we need to think actually of what we want the end result to be and not whether it maps technically onto something that's a reproduction or a derivative work. But that, that's where we are. Hey, Bill. Um, I, I, I was listening to your story about narratives um, and, and the, the, the storytelling uh, that yields policy choices here in Washington. And I couldn't help but thinking how increasingly those policy choices tell their own story, one that's, that's largely not heard here in D.C. And, and isn't all necessarily entirely sound either. Um, and so we see events like, uh, you know, uh, the, the Europeans electing uh, members of the Pirate Party to the European Parliament and, and very reputable economists saying this whole intellectual property thing is, is, is wrong. Um, and I think part of that is a result of 
uh, sort of policy choices here in DC, term extension, DRM protection. Uh, you know, we see the file sharing litigation against end users, uh, you know, single mothers living in the projects, dead people being sued by the recording industry. Uh, and that sort of tells a story outside of Washington that has, has, has in a lot of ways, sort of undermined the credibility of the entire system, uh, which, which should worry us as professionals who, you know, make our living off that system, that there's a lot of people outside of it who think this entire thing is, is bunk. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, that, that, that if you have any thoughts on these two sort of competing narratives that, that talk past each other, they're, you know, ships passing in the night. Right, right. So I, I think that's an issue that is obviously much larger than copyright. And uh, this is going to sound very anti-DC and I apologize for it. Um, I spent 13 years here and they were great years and, and I loved it. Um, but when I left, it was really very liberating. It was really quite wonderful. Um, and it was wonderful <laughs> in this way. And I love coming back. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, what, what, what happened when I was here um, is that, and th this, is, this is not DC physically. This, this is DC, as, as Matt's talking about it, as, as, a, as a policy, Capitol Hill sort of thing, right? I'm not, I'm not talking more generically about DC as, as a city, um, but it's how these debates occur. And what, what I think happens um, is that everyone believes that the decisions that are made here, the stories that are told here, um, are, are, are the center of the world <laughs> and are the right stories. And that the decisions that are made um, are, are decisions that are made based upon facts, based upon data and, and, and based upon uh, an impact that will genuinely occur in the real world. And I don't think it's true at all. It's not true at all. And when you live outside of it, you sort of wonder, how did I ever believe that? What was wrong with me? And it gets back to what I said at the beginning, that we are our own worst enemies. And it doesn't matter you know, whether you're working in the DC bubble or whether you're in a corporation and, you know, you, you sort of drink the, the Kool-Aid of what it is, right? That, then there's nothing you can do about it. When I was a law student, um, we had, I had a torts teacher who was probably 85 and had done many things in his life. And one of the things he told us is that every job he had, he had a number of jobs, he became convinced <laughs> of the rightness of the cause and became convinced that their story was the right story. I think it's just a human condition. Um, that is very hard to escape some. So, well, I, I, I mean, it seemed like it's anti-DC. I, 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 I hope it's really a larger issue. Um, and that, that's why I wanted to tell the story about the medical things, both because it's fresh for me <laughs> personally, but I actually saw how it worked. You know, how people who are really good doctors, these were all really great doctors. I mean, the neurologist I went to who determined that I had acute brachial plexus neuritis, which I'd never heard of, you know, just by looking at me, you know, was looking at things that made sense. In fact, after he told me this thing, I went home and Googled it, um, and I thought, that's amazing. He's right. That is what I have. You know? Um, and because the, the symptoms were astonishingly like what I had. You know? They're, it's not that people are crazy or that they're missing things. They do know things. You know? They know a lot of things. But you know what? You can be wrong. You can think you're right and you can be wrong. And the problem is getting yourself to think outside of yourself. That's an amazingly hard thing to do. Um, and I, I, I wish I could count on one hand the number of times I've done it. But I think it's a really worthwhile thing to try and do. Um, so for DC, you know, um, um, you know we're, we're blessed to have people like you who you know, can, can show us um, other stories, other compelling stories. Um, but in the end, to me, you have to want to believe it. You, know, you have to want to think of other stories. Just like the radiologists, that's why I think that's a great story. The radiologists who are, her eyes were being tracked didn't have this bias. You know, they, maybe they were told they had pneumonia and so the bias was they were told one thing. Um, but because of that they didn't see other stuff. So to me, unless you're willing to open your mind up to other stories consciously, 
You can't do it. You can't do it. Yes, sir. This may be a little bit of a stretch, but uh, I just wanted to ask you about what you think um, regarding the recent uh, debate between Apple and Adobe. Between who and who? Apple Computer and oh, yes. Adobe. Oh, Apple and Adobe, yeah. Right, right. The, uh, the issue of the Flash uh, application. Right. And um, it has to do with open source. Right. And uh, open knowledge. Right. Online libraries and the cost of uh, just knowing things yeah, yeah. in the digital age compared to what you have explained uh, so far, like uh, bootleg copies in the pre-digital era. So the question is, um, what do you think of uh, open source right. and how can it be implemented not only within the U.S. and worldwide? Right. So I don't know the, a lot about the details of that specific one. I've done some reading about it. and. You know, it's sort of funny that, that both companies claim they're on the side of being open. <laughs> right? And the other one says, no, you're closed. No, I'm open. Um, so, you know, I like, I like Apple products a lot. Um, I'm less infatuated with Adobe products because I find it annoying that you can't really edit PDFs or at least do it effectively. <laughs> um, but the, uh, I've tried really hard lots of times <laughs> to do this um, and bought a number of, of Adobe products that should let me do it, but I've never been able to figure it out. So I find it very frustrating to have a closed system like that. Uh, I think it's one of, the, one of the great questions that we have is open versus closed. You know, Facebook is a closed system. Um, iTunes is a closed system. Um, my company is very much in favor of open systems. And you know, people will say, well, you're in favor of open systems because that benefits you economically. I think that's true. <laughs> I don't think it's surprising that companies are in favor of things that benefit them economically. The question for the public, I think, and this is an attempt to answer your question directly, is what benefits the public the most? Right? Is it open versus closed? Apple would say, I believe, although I don't know this, that closed systems, by which they would mean they exercise quality control over their products, are in the public's best interest because the public is getting the best quality thing. Other would say, no, that's just sort of a disguise because you want people to do certain things. So for me, the, the ultimate question is, what's in the public's best interest? My own bias? Um, is that open, <laughs> is in the public's best interest, because I believe that the public has lots of things to contribute to stuff, and that the old sort of way of doing things, I'm deliberately not using, using the hackneyed word paradigm, um, the old way of, of, of copyright, which is complete vertical control, right? The, 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 the goal for many copyright owners, especially motion picture studios, would have been the golden era of studios where they own the actors, they own the writers, they own the copyright, they own the theaters. They own everything all the way through, right? Versus a situation where we have now where that's very hard to do. So if yesterday I had in our New York office the Israeli Council General in, I, we were giving him a demonstration of maps, right? So if you take Google Maps, we can put things out there. But if we controlled what people did with those maps, um, it wouldn't be very valuable at all. What's valuable is the stuff that people add to it, right? So the first one, was, one of the first ones was uh, rentals in San Francisco. Another one was Chicago crime, where people created overlays, where they took crime statistics and they overlaid them to your neighborhoods. Um, and now, of course, you overlay tons of things. And to me, that's much better than having a closed system. To me, having systems that are open and let everyone contribute stuff we're all better off for it. But it's, you know, it's a matter of philosophy, I think. Um, AT&T once, when they dominated everything, someone told them about an idea, an idea that was very close to what the internet became. And they said two things. One, it's not technically possible, and if it is, we'll kill it. <laughs> right? <laughs> so... Yona, do you have a question? No? Okay. 
<laughs> Great. Thank you very much.